Welcome to the Chorus One Podcast. In this podcast, we explore the emerging open financial system facilitated by scalable, interoperable blockchain networks. Tune in every Wednesday to dive deep into cutting edge projects and protocols with Chorus One team members and guests. Hi, this is Felix from Chorus One, and welcome to this week's episode of the Chorus One Podcast. This episode will be a quite a bit of a different format than the usual interviews and discussions we have on here. In that, in this episode, I want to be talking about a topic that I find quite interesting, and that is the history of proof of stake. So, in this episode, I first want to kind of talk about economic principles that exist in the real world today and have been existing for over thousands of years, and how they kind of are similar to what we're seeing in proof of stake today. And then, in the second part, cover how proof of stake in the actual cryptocurrency space has evolved from 2012 to where it is today, and maybe also what we can expect and what is there to come. So to let me start, maybe I can talk to you about what I think is very good analogy to proof of stake from the real world, which is surety bond. So to explain what a surety bond is, I want to use two examples from the early days of humankind, which are both like almost 4,000 years old. So the first one is about a farmer that had to leave to join the king's army and he had to leave his farm behind and he wanted to make an agreement with uh, another farmer that he will service his farm and they will share the revenues. But he also wanted to make sure that this farmer actually does it. So he will take on a third party, which was a merchant, to serve as the surety that the second farmer takes care of the farm. This took place, it's like a oral communication in the 2750 before Christ. But there's also another recorded history, which is actually engraved on the tablets from Mesopotamia, which is present day Iraq that has been found like in the 19th century, which depicts an arrangement about the payment of corn, which was the currency at that time, where uh, there's also three parties depicted. So these three parties are the three constituents of a surety bond even till today. And you call them the first party, the obligé, which is the person that is expecting some kind of obligation to be fulfilled. In this case, it is the payment of corn. Then there's the second party, it's the principal. This is the party that is supposed to fulfill this obligation. And then there's a third party, which is the surety. This is the party that needs to make sure or take over the obligation if the principal fails to deliver on the promise. So he provides this, what is called a surety bond to the obligé that he will take over if the principal fails to deliver and basically lowering his risk, of course, in expectation of some kind of premium or uh, interest. In the second story, the obligé is actually the Babylonian king Dungi. And this tablet that was found in Mesopotamia even was recorded by some professional notary where there are actually four witnesses inscribed in this agreement. And since then, there have been a lot of these tablets found from the Mesopotamian area. And yeah, I find it quite interesting that this thing has been existing for so long and we're now seeing it in proof of stake. So let me tell you what I mean if I say that the surety bond is kind of similar to proof of stake. Basically, what you can think of is the stake. So the cryptocurrency that's being staked and then the proof of stake network is the surety bond. As a token holder, I stake my tokens with a validator and through that I'm providing the surety bond to the protocol, which is the obligé, that this validator will meet his obligation to stay online and to validate the transactions. And this makes the validator kind of the principle of this agreement. So obviously the token holder does provide the surety only because he's expecting some future payments, which are the staking rewards. And then in, in proof of stake network, even the surety bond can be claimed by the protocol, right? If there's a slashing, basically the principal has failed to meet his obligation. So the protocol can take away some of this surety bond, which usually happens if there's a double signing, for example, or in some protocols also if the party goes offline. But there's one difference between a normal, like a surety bond, that is how it's used in the real world and how it is used in proof of stake is that usually the premiums for providing a surety bond are paid to some kind of insurance company that wants to get the revenues or wants to take over the risk. But in proof of stake, it's actually paid by the WG, like the protocol itself. So that's quite interesting how that is. And maybe to also, I have this also written as a post. You can find it on our blog, 
I will link to it in the show notes, but maybe also just another example from how surety bonds are used in the real world to make you understand like the relationship a bit better. So usually the obligé in the real world is some kind of government authority that wants to have some, let's say, building built and contract some contractor for it. This is the principle the contractor has to fulfill this obligation. He has to build this building, but at the same time, the government authority might want to like lower their risk that this person or this firm won't deliver this on their promise. So they hire some insurance company that has to provide a surety bond if the obligations are not met and pay out so that the risk for the government authority is lowered. Insurance company obviously does this in exchange for some kind of premiums that the contractor has to provide them. Now that you understand the relationship between surety bonds and proof of stake, let's go into how these fundamental economic principles came about in the world of distributed systems and digital assets. So the history of proof of stake starts in 2012 with the inception of the uh, Sunny King and Scott Nadal, who first suggested like proof of stake as an alternative to the then already established proof of work used in Bitcoin. They also coined the term staking in this paper. And what they did was they described an algorithm that would choose the block producing nodes based on the amount of stake they had in their wallet and the age of the coins. And in 2013, they actually released the uh, peer coin which is still around today. And it was also the first hybrid cryptocurrency because Peercoin used proof of work to distribute the tokens and proof of stake to validate the transactions. So in a way, it's also interesting that already they realized, okay, some proof of stake coins have a bit of a problem with the token distribution. So they made use of proof of work to kind of distribute the tokens more fairly and widely, which I think is also a problem in some of the current proof of stake networks. Then in 2013, to continue with the history, many cryptocurrencies followed this design of Peercoin and tweaked some things of it. So notable examples include, for example, NXT, which uses like randomization to select a block, produce it based on stake. So in Peercoin, it was more like if you mined a coin and it was certain, it had the age and then was like kind of the age and the stake. And when you were chosen as a block producer, the age of your coin kind of reset it. So that's how block producers were chosen in NXT. They use some randomization through the hashes on the blockchain. And this model has been used a lot also by other coins, for example, Blackcoin or Qtum use some kind of similar staking mechanisms. But all of these have the problem or this idea of the nothing at stake attack. So the nothing at stake idea is that basically because it doesn't cost you anything as a staker to attack or to mine on a different fork than the one that is there. People would like mine on two different ones and you couldn't ever really know if you're on the right blockchain. In practice, there hasn't been many recordings or these currencies are all still around and maybe they don't have enough value or simply this attack doesn't really take place. But still it is a theorized attack and other cryptocurrencies actually improved on it. An important cut in the history of proof of stake happens in 2014 around the time when Ethereum is announced by Vitalik Buterin. He also already thought about how to move away from proof of work and also saw proof of stake as one of the solutions to that problem and wrote an article about the slasher algorithm, which also gave birth to the term slashing that we use till today. And this algorithm was supposed to solve this theorized nothing at stake problem that other proof of stake implementations had. So if you look on the Ethereum blog today, you can still find this slasher post, which is quite interesting. And at the same time, Jay Kwan, the creator of Tendermint, which is the first BFT proof of stake, or actually it's a BFT protocol that is used both in permissioned and permissionless blockchains, for example, in Cosmos. And Jay Kwan wrote a Tendermint paper, Consensus Without Mining. And Jay Kwan was the first to kind of combine insights from Byzantine von Tolerant research in distributed systems with kind of the notion of digital assets and came up with Tendermint, which is also the first mention of using cryptocurrency as the bond to ensure behavior of the actors in this proof of stake system. And also in 2014, so this was quite an eventful year for proof of stake, Daniel Larimer launched BitShares, which was the first blockchain that used his version of delegated proof of stake. Basically, the consensus participants are also chosen by their stake, but they are voted into this validator set 
through the stake. So basically how DPoS works is you have a fixed set of validators and then based on stake and every few time periods, uh, voting happens where it gets decided who stays in the set and who goes out. This DPoS scheme was also later adopted by Lisk and Steemit and EOS. So this model is also quite successful, but nowadays most of the proof of stake implementations we see are based on this idea that the stake actually is the deciding factor who gets to vote on a block and how much someone's vote in the consensus process counts. So then there was a quiet phase actually between like these very eventful 2014 because people were building their protocols and researching their stuff. And in 2015 and 2016, there was not that much uh, happening in the proof of stake space. So 2015 marked the year where Ethereum launched using the ETHash proof of work algorithm that's still there today. So even though Ethereum like has been planning to move to proof of stake since the beginning, actually, there's still uh, actually now it's very close, let's say, hopefully. But since then, it's been proof of work and it is still there and probably it's going to stay, the proof of work chain is going to stay there for quite some while. While uh, in 2016, something new started to happen. And what that was is uh, the Cosmos white paper was released, which described the proof of stake system that used Tendermint consensus and basically described this internet of blockchains. So like of like a network of multiple blockchains and how they communicate, intercommunicate out of all of these different BFT networks. And at the same year also, Decred launched its main net with a hybrid system of proof of work for block production and proof of stake for checkpointing. Then 2017 happened, which was uh, quite the year of peak hype around cryptocurrencies, as I'm sure many of you know. Like many projects raised ICOs and also released white papers, but on there, a lot of like not so good projects, there were also several legit ones that raised funds and kind of plan to use proof of stake to those belong, for example, Cardano, Cosmos, Polkadot, or Tezos. And actually the Tezos white paper, for example, was already out since 2014 and described this blockchain with an uh, on-chain governance mechanism that could like upgrade itself. But in 2017, like most of these fundraisers happened, as you know, many of these went on to raise quite a sufficient amount of funds, let's say, and uh, are still developing their proof of stake algorithms or uh, actually are live like Cosmos and Tezos. And in that year, also a lot of research happened around like Ethereum's move to proof of stake, specifically around the Casper protocol. So one of them is uh, Casper CBC, which was led by Vlad Zamfir. The, it's the correct by construction approach. So there was also this project called Rchain from the founder Greg Meredith that use this like mathematically proven way of describing the consensus protocol, which is still today, Vlad Zamfir is researching and our chain kind of split off into this Casper Labs. They are still planning to use Casper CBC. And I think they are the ones that are still on the forefront of this approach. And the other Casper idea was Casper FFG, which is kind of Vitalik led research which is uh, a friendly finality gadget where basically uh, the f idea first was to use proof of stake to finalize blocks on this proof of work chain by having validators vote based on stake on the blocks in similar to a BFT way, okay, two thirds agreement, the block is considered finalized and so on. But both of these approaches actually are, uh, yeah, Casper CBC is still being researched, but Casper FFG got scratched, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So let's move into 2018. So after all these projects raised funds, there we start to see some new type of ecosystem forming after people realized, okay, there's going to be these networks that need validators or this kind of new party that should validate transactions and participate in this BFT network. So one of the first companies that started to look at how does this actually look, how does a business around that look? is Chorus One, which I'm a part of, and obviously. And this has been a space that had started forming in 2018, and today we could see it growing and growing. For example, when the Tezos blockchain launched in June 2018, which is kind of an important date for proof of stake, there have been quite a few bakers, right? In the beginning of 2018, there were like, I think, two bakers that were planning to release this uh, staking service for Tezos. And then now it's up to more than 400 bakers in the Tezos blockchain 
which makes it one of the most decentralized, or at least in a number of node count decentralized ones. So the other big thing that happened in 2018 was kind of the Ethereum scratched their plans to implement this Casper FFG uh, checkpointing system on the proof of work chain and combined all the proof of stake efforts and the sharding effort that was already around at that time into one umbrella effort, which is called Ethereum 2.0 or Serenity. So basically sharding is this uh, scaling solution where you have now multiple blockchains that are able to communicate to each other and that share the security or the same validator set that get shuffled around these different shards. And basically through that, you are able to achieve much higher throughput. And this has been researched since 2018. I think at DEF CON, it was fully announced that this will be a combined research effort and the different phases were announced, how the transition is actually going to happen, what will be part of the Ethereum 2.0 chain, for example, uh, eWASM and state rent and so on. And then another thing that happened in 2018, you started to see the Cosmos validator ecosystem maturing. There were like lots of test nets happening. The uh, Cosmos code base got more and more feature complete. And at the end of 2018, we started with the first incentivized testnet of it in the world, actually, which is the Cosmos Game of Stakes. And that was obviously a quite interesting uh, time for proof of stake and, and all this validator ecosystem. And I'm, I'm sure many that participated in that had their trial by fire through this <laughs> during this event. And now only like six, I think it was like six weeks after, or maybe two months after the Game of Stakes ended, the Cosmos Hub launched its mainnet and has been live ever since and became like the first permissionless BFT network in the world, which is like kind of amazing. And now in 2019, we're seeing so many new proof of stake protocols or in consensus algorithms. And a lot of these networks that also raised money in 2017, 18 or 18 are now planning to move and to launch or are in some testnet phase or planning to launch their own incentivized testnets. So it, be, it feels like we're moving into like a very exciting time for proof of stake. Just to mention like a few things, maybe you, you now have Polkadot and their hybrid consensus of like Grandpa, which is this finality gadget and uh, BAPE, which is the block production consensus algorithm. We have Ouroboros, Genesis from uh, the Cardano or like the IOHK team, which is also, for example, used by Coda. We have like stuff like Hot Stuff, BFT. We had Libra using some BFT inspired, Tendermint inspired, B Hot Stuff inspired algorithm. We have many, many different networks like Solana, Scale, everyone using some form of proof of stake and moving close to their launch phases. So I think it's very interesting and we will see what will happen this year. Also the Ethereum 2.0 specifications are finalized. Like the, all these implemented teams are, are building their clients and potentially in the beginning of next year, we will see the, the, the beacon chain launching. So I think I hope this gave you some basic overview of the history of proof of stake and also how it relates to this old economic concept of surety bonds. And I think, yeah, we are still uh, in the very early days, as you can tell, like right now, there's not that many networks actually online, like many are in this testnet phase. And I think the next few months and years, we will see like a lot of innovation and a lot of experimentation, which is good, especially, I guess, around different incentive designs. How do you actually make sure your network is decentralized? How can you do better token distributions? We, we saw, for example, the Edgeware lock drop where you lock up your ether and you get a of this other token. There's still the idea of photons in the Cosmos ecosystem where there might be like an airdrop of, of these tokens to, to Ethereum holders and many, many other different experiments. For example, this nominated proof of stake algorithm, which we had Alfonso on here to talk about in the second episode, there's uh, anti-correlation penalties. So for example, designing the slashing in a way that if a lot of the state goes offline at the same time or double signs at the same time, the slashing is higher than if it's only one. And a very interesting concepts that hopefully will make the network more robust, but at the same time also keep decentralization. And another concept that come around and we can see in staking right now is kind of these exchanges also entering the game. We saw Poloniex offering staking for atoms. So uh, there is also some 
risk there where we can that we can might see where like maybe centralized parties make it easier for people to participate in staking by allowing for example you to trade your atoms or any other cryptocurrency while you stake it while if you just use the normal delegation you will have to wait the unbonding period in in many designs so there is also like lots of innovation happening around that how can you achieve the same things in a decentralized fashion so one of the ideas there are these delegation vouchers that we designed together with Sika, for example, which is basically some kind of way to have a fungible representation of your staking position that you can then kind of trade if you want to exit your staking position. And through that, maybe kind of level the playing field between custodial parties and uh, decentralized staking operators. So I'm sure there's like a lot of stuff coming up in these realms. I'm make sure to uh, follow us on Twitter to stay informed and subscribe to Stake Economy newsletter where I cover together with Chris Remus uh, the developments in in the proof of stake ecosystem. So the, if you follow Stake Economy, I'm sure you will stay on top of everything that goes on in staking and also join our Telegram and engage in, in a discussion what ideas you have, what you are seeing in Proof of Stake and how you see it evolving. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, I will put links to some of the stuff I mentioned in the show notes. And yeah, see you next week for another episode of the Chorus One podcast. Thank you for listening to the Chorus One podcast. Visit chorus.one for more information about our work. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to stay tuned on new episodes airing every Wednesday.